Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. I have a great pleasure to announce the presence of a member of the European Union Parliament, Ivan Willibor Sinchich. He is very well known because of his fight for the human rights and freedom. And it seems that today we need it more than ever. He will be talking about two interesting topics, the climate change and the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for coming here today. Uh, this seminar was supposed to be held in the uh, time machine, but uh, since the weather is not very nice today, we have moved here in this area. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm Ivan Velibarsinčić. I am a member of European Parliament from Croatia. I have been in politics for 10 years. I think it's a good idea to make a short introduction of myself or of my political career. Uh, I have joined politics in 2011 when I was a student and uh, we were protesting, our entire generation in a way was protesting uh, the austerity measures of Yelenka Kosov government at that time. So uh, this is how we started and soon there was a huge problem in Croatia and it was a problem of evictions. People were losing their homes, their only homes, their shelters, roofs over their heads, young people, old people, uh, entire families were losing their only homes. They were being thrown out on the street and the system, the government and the political elite, the establishment of Croatia didn't care what would happen to them. So we felt it was wrong, it was inhuman, it was violation of human rights, it was social injustice. So uh, we have organized a, a group of activists, we called ourselves GDZ, Human Blockade, and uh, whenever there was an eviction in Croatia, we went there and we made a blockade between the police and the family living there, and we said, no, we will not allow this to happen, this is wrong, we will not allow this family to lose its own home, and we were doing that week after week, month after month, year after year, and uh, we were on the margin of Croatian political life. In 2014, I became a candidate for the president of Croatia, and at that time, uh, our movement came into the center of Croatian political life and uh, ever since uh, more and more people know what we are doing and uh, what are our values. In this corona crisis, human rights are endangered, I could freely say, more than ever, or at least more... <laughs> they are endangered uh, more than ever, but since the human rights have been established just after the Second World War, I would say also more than since they ever existed in a legal way. Uh, our topic today is both the corona crisis, the pandemic, some call it pandemic, and of course the climate change. Uh, I shall start with the, the Corona crisis and in the end you will see why did I start with uh, the Corona crisis because these things are uh, connected. So, I am in European Parliament and uh, there are 22 committees and one of the committees is ENVI Committee, Environment, Public Health and Food Safety. So you have uh, full members and people who are not full members. I'm a full member of this end committee, so we have regular sessions on various topics uh, about European Green Plan, about climate change, about new energy sources, 
about food safety, about pesticides, what goes into food, what will be banned, what will be allowed, what quantities, uh, about different chemicals, and of course public health. And um, since we are in a health crisis, our committee came into focus of the committee. So basically everything the European Union is making on this crisis goes to our committee. So I will tell you uh, about a few events that we had. I will share what I found out there. Uh, let's start with a short introduction to some European institutions. So European Union is not a country, it's not a state, it's an organization. It has seven basic institutions. Uh, one of them is European Parliament, and in this Parliament, as I said, there are committees. In any committee where I am a member, uh, deals with a certain uh, things, the ones I already mentioned, and uh, occasionally, uh, especially now in this crisis, people from Commission come and they give us reports. So, European Parliament is one of the seven members, seven uh, basic institutions of the European Union, and I will also mention an institution called EMA, European Medicines Agency. And there are some others. All of them are responsible to our committee. Uh, all of this started uh, more than a year ago, about a year and a half ago. And ever since the beginning, as I found out, there were frequent meetings between the Commission and the representatives of various pharmaceutical companies. Uh, my sources even tell me that there were daily meetings with those pharmaceutical companies. But this is something they were hiding. But in recent months, we managed to come to this information, and I think it will be more and more interesting as more and more things will be revealed in the future. So, from the start, as it seems now, they had an agenda. Uh, the crisis was there. Some of them probably knew that it was spread from China to Europe, and they already knew what the solutions will be. So, they had decided they will uh, make vaccines and they then decided they will have official authority about this crisis. It goes simply like this. Vaccines are the only solutions. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe. And this is their basic thesis of the European establishment from the beginning of the crisis until now. And we can see a pattern here, pattern that is not logical for me. I'm an establishment politician. I have been all my life. I fought corruption. I wanted uh, human rights to be respected. I wanted uh, there is uh, free speech, true uh, free speech, and not this what people see in the media, unfortunately. Many of the mainstream media are just repeating uh, the same story. There is very little media space for people who have different opinions. Just recently in Croatia, uh, there was um, like a media lynch against a scientist who was a dean of a college for secretion public because he expressed a different scientific opinion than was expected by the establishment, uh, a different scientific opinion than some of the other scientists who are connected with the government, who are either being paid by the government or have some other known or unknown connections to the government. Uh, so we can see this discrepancy. We see this huge canyon between these two, between uh, these two, I would say, schools of, of thought. What I have always thought for was equal conditions for a real debate in power. I wanted that on a daily basis, we have a real debate between all scientific opinions. 
And since we don't have that, what do we have? We have censorship. We have uh, we can hear only one side, and uh, we have a certain situation of uh, of lynch and situation of excluding and marginalizing everybody who is not agreeing with the government. And whenever people on the streets, or my voters, or my colleagues ask me, what do you think about, about this corona crisis? I tell them, well, this is like 90% politics, and it's only 10% science. And uh, now it's even worse. I think now it's 95% politics, 5% science. So from the beginning, they have excluded all the other solutions. So I ask the people from the Commission, from the European Commission, and the Commission is also one of the seven basic institutions of the European Union. Okay, uh, why do you only want to solve this with vaccines? Why are we not making the deal? <coughs> there are scientists all around the world. I have connections with some of them. I'm trying to be connected with all of them because I want them to be heard in Europe and globally. And they are offering different solutions as well. There is something called the Nuremberg Code, or Nuremberg Codex in Croatia and Bosnia. In there, this is like uh, Ten Commandments of God. It has ten points. And basically what it uh, says, what is the logic of this document, is that everybody must have a right to choose their own therapy. If I want to take vaccine, it's my choice. If I want to take a medication, it's also my choice. If I want to use some third type of treatment, it's also my choice. But is the establishment following the logic of this Nuremberg code? They're not in fact. So, they couldn't give me a, an answer to this question. You can find these days, I think it's already one year and a half too late. You can see some attempts to also allow uh, the sudden solution, the solution of finding a cure. So what am I basically doing? I'm trying to empower uh, activists, scientists, basically anyone all around the world. I have connections with Australia, United States, all around Europe, and I'm trying to improve them at all times. I want to help these people to be heard as much as I can um, at their disposal at all times. Um, I will also tell you about a certain event that happened in February this year. So there was a session of Henry Committee and we had an opportunity uh, to see seven CEOs or directors from seven major pharmaceutical companies. There were Sanofi Pasteur, and, uh, and Pfizer, and uh, Novavax, and many others. The big seven directors from representatives from pharmaceutical companies. So we, members of the European Parliament, members of the committee, were asking questions to them, expecting answers. And the two most important questions were, if they were defending their medical product there, they were defending the vaccine they made. First, what is the efficiency of this vaccine? So you get vaccinated with a Pfizer product. How much time are you protected from coronavirus? Uh, basically, there was, there was no answer to this question. Nobody, no, none of them could answer you this simple question to take this medical product, and you are protected one month, five months, three years, and nobody could tell uh, uh, anything. So basically they concluded, yeah, this is a new product, we don't know, we are making the research, and when we find out, we will tell you. And the second question we were asking was about the efficiency. So if you vaccinate 100 people, how many of them will have unexpected good reaction to this product. So they were saying like 95%, 99%, 85%, every director said that it is not. Uh, but this was not really reliable. 
I didn't trust these numbers. So shortly after this session, I also made a contact with Emma, European Medicines Agency, and I had a 30-minute conversation with their representative. And they answered all my questions. And I was astonished that they did. And they just confirmed everything that I already assumed. So they confirmed that uh, 99% vaccine efficiency is a bit too much. They didn't also expect it to be that high. They were expecting more like more, more like 50%. But uh, they simply said, yeah, we expected like more like 50%. But we trusted the pharmaceutical company that made it. So, you know, we don't, we don't have any choice. I also asked them, do you have any independent confirmation of these clinical studies that were made before uh, the vaccine was approved? Of course they don't. There, is, there was absolutely no independent confirmation of any of these products. Everything Emma knew about these vaccines were the information that pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, Novax, etc. gave gave to them. So how do we know that it was a good product? I swear on my mother's life, it's an excellent product. And this is the only thing, this was the only thing they had. Just a study made by the pharmaceutical company for their own product and non independent contribution. But as they would say in, in, in the Balkans, my commit rat. I swear on my mother's life, it's a good product. No independent test. Also, of course, they didn't have any middle term uh, effects. Of course, no, they didn't know, know anything about long term effects. They don't know to this day because, of course, not enough time has passed. So, basically, what this is with this vaccine is basically a huge experiment with unknown consequences. Just a moment. Sorry. Uh, what a good politician would do is to allow everybody to speak their mind, to allow every solution to be tested. Why wasn't there? Uh, why wasn't there enough resources secured for the cures, like hydroxychloroquine or even medicine, and, and there were some others? No, from the start they simply didn't want them because there was a political decision made by the commission. We don't want to fund the medication. We don't want to hear about medication. The only thing we want, we want to make these vaccines as many as we can, and then we want to sell them. Uh, there was also one important thing I found out on this session with the directors of the pharmaceutical companies. The one was saying, yeah, we will be making 500 million doses per year. We will be making a billion per year. We will be making two billion per year. So basically, you don't make a new factory or multiple factories all around the world if you want this crisis to last only one year. It is in their interest, and I think somebody promised it to them, somebody from the political establishment has either promised to them or has given them a sign, this is a good investment, this crisis will last very long, or we want it to last very long. You do build new factories all around the world, which they did, and they said they did, or they will be finishing them soon. And their plan is, of course, to make many billions, uh, many more billion vaccine doses per year and to sell them to the population. So, what we can see here, I call simple corruption, because it, there are lobbying offices in Brussels, not just for pharmaceutical companies. There are lobbying offices for uh, energy companies, telecom companies. Basically every important industry has their uh, representatives in Brussels and they have regular meetings with the Commission, even with some members of the Parliament. And some of these meetings are even publicly declared. 
So if you are a commissioner, you have a, or, or, or board president, president of any committee, and you have a meeting with someone from the industry, you have to, um, you have, you have to declare this publicly, so you can basically find some information on this, uh, on these meetings as well. But of course, the most important things are probably made either before the decisions are made or in secret. This is uh, a reasonable assumption. So, what the Commission should have allowed, they should have allowed for every scientist to offer a solution and uh, they didn't do that. And uh, I'm criticizing them for that. This is not an isolated case. It's not just the European Union. The similar things are happening in the United States. In Australia, which is in complete lockdown these days. Uh, and basically, in the most of the world, this is a coordinated action, coordinated response or coordinated operation, coordinated response to this crisis, whatever you want to call it, but it is coordinated. Uh, I wouldn't make a huge mistake if I simply said that they are just following the narrative of WHO, World, World Health Organization. Whatever World Health Organization uh, decided to be a standard, a standard, many others are simply copy-pasting that and are using all of these uh, recommendations. But there are some things you need to know. Pandemic. Basically, these days, anything could be a pandemic because they changed the definition. It was an administrative change of words in a sentence, and it's much easier <laughs> for anything to be a pandemic these days. A pandemics, uh, when a pandemic was declared 10 years ago, there were different conditions than the conditions you have today. So they say we have a pandemic. Okay, we have a pandemic. Some scientists doubt this. I, as a politician, want everybody to have a say, for everybody to have an opportunity to be heard, so we can make the best conclusion. All around the world, you can see this uh, uh, crisis management. You can see these the people who are uh, we call it in, in here. Uh, this is like a, a headquarters for civil protection. They are managing these measures. Well, is it either a distance or a mask rules or, or is it a lockdown measure? Uh, they are making the job, they are doing the job instead of the government. So people who are in these bodies are brutally uh, endangering our human rights, our constitutional rights. I'm also proud to be here in Bosnia and Herzegovina and I mentioned Bosnia and Herzegovina in my speech because you in Bosnia and Herzegovina here have a, a constitutional court decision saying that uh, constitutional rights of the people or peoples of Bosnia and Herzegovina were endangered and you should be proud of this decision. Many nations around the world didn't have uh, such a decision. There was, there is now a recent decision from Spain constitutional court, but in Croatia we didn't have such a constitutional court decision. Um, let's get back now to the, let's say, like a bird eye approach to the situation. So we have PCR test, which is one of the pillars of this pandemic. As we all know, PCR test, or I suppose we all know, since we are here, PCR test is not a reliable for diagnostics. Even the inventor, the Nobel Prize winner, Kerry Mullis, while he was alive, uh, said that. So the PCR test is not reliable. The measures such as lockdown or masks are also not very effective. We can see this in numbers, examples are all around the world. Uh, we also have the censorship. Why is Nobel Prize winner Luc Montagne, a Frenchman, who won a Nobel Prize 
for discovering the HIV virus 30 or 40 years ago. Why are his videos being deleted from YouTube or Facebook? Is he not a scientist? Is he not an expert? They are being deleted because he has an opinion different than these headquarters for civil protection, so-called civil protection. So, and the same fate is with uh, Mr. Krasin Pavlovich from Croatia, which is our recent example. Uh, or, uh, I don't know, Didier Raoult from Spain, who is, uh, uh, who is promoting hydroxychloroquine, and many others. So we have this censorship, and uh, we have brutal bra breaking of, of law, of human rights, uh, basically anything. And uh, when you put all of this together, you see, you basically see that this is not so much because of the virus. I don't hear them speak too much about virus. They either speak of vaccine or, or measures or, or... It's terrible, you know. What I also want, and I find it is a good example, <coughs> is uh, an apology to German people from uh, the chief editor of Bild newspapers. So he apologized to the German people that, they were, that his newspaper was wrong when they were, they were spreading fear and panic all around Germany and all around Europe. Because I will tell you how the European Union functions when everything, something happens in Germany. <laughs> there is a good chance it will happen all around Europe because Germany and France are leading the way in the European Union. When they make a policy about anything, then most of the time the rest of the European Union simply complies with this policy. So I would like to hear uh, media directives from Croatia, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, from everywhere basically, apologizing to their people, saying yes, it was wrong to spread fear, to spread panic, it was wrong to say that a grandchild will kill their grandparents if they are in the same room. It was terrible wrong and uh, we are so sorry we did it. And I, I hope this will make a good example as well. So all of this official narrative, in my opinion, is collapsing because there was simply no logic in it. There was simply no good intention in it. And uh, what I'm working on now, and we are having a huge conference in Rome in a month, uh, I want that people, doctors, medical scientists, even lawyers, and everybody else, to be heard. And I want their clinical experience, their experience while treating the patients, their uh, science papers, their research to be heard, and uh, so that in the end the best solution could be, could be found and implemented. This is an approach that should have been made from the very beginning. But it wasn't made. Because the entire situation is biased. They have chosen the one side and they have told all the media, all the institutions, from the EMA to any, any other, this is the official truth, this is the, the, how things must be, and everything else is simply heresy. If a scientist is being bullied, if a scientist is being ignored, censored, because he or she has a different scientific opinion, it's not science. This is not science, and I have said that in the European Parliament. This is not science, what you are doing. It's more like a, a dogma or some kind of a religion, a cult of COVID or cult of face mask or anything like Call it what you want. This is not how science works and it has nothing to do with science or logic. So I think things are going now in a very good way and that peoples all around the world are tired of uh, are tired of what governments are doing to them and that they, that they will be asking their rights back, they will be asking uh, their freedom back and uh, I believe that we will have a positive outcome of this crisis. And it's not just 
some imaginary people, it's all of us. Everybody in this room must do his or her part of the work. I, I'm doing it, I hope I'm doing it good. I will do whatever I can to have a, a right approach in this crisis. In this uh, civil headquarters for protection of, from COVID, why are there no economies? This uh, lockdown measures, they're devastating the economy. Why are there no psych psychologists? So they can explain what fear does to human mind, to human physiology, what stress caused by all of this, by spreading panic, is doing to human health, what masks are doing to the health of children in schools, which are by far uh, the least endangered group by this COVID virus. I wouldn't be wrong if I said even that uh, if you're a child, you have zero chance of having any problems with COVID. So why, are we, why do we have, or some other uh, nations, why do they have so strict measures in schools against children? Why are we vaccinating children with experimental vaccine? Some even called it uh, experimental gene therapy. Why are we using that on a group that is absolutely immune to this virus. Uh, there was, as time goes by, more and more and more and more information is going public. So recently you had a statement uh, from the United Kingdom. An official said that the herd immunity will never be, will never, will be never reached. So uh, this is big news and it's probably a turning point. And uh, it will be very interesting to follow the development of the situation in the future. So basically, to sum up this topic, what we need is the most efficient, the most safe, and the most also cheap way to solve this crisis. What we don't need is censorship, fear, unreliable diagnostics, uh, waste of money, waste of time, and this is precisely what they did. And I think uh, that somebody from these institutions I mentioned in the beginning, that somebody from WHO will have to be held accountable. And uh, we should also use legal means the decisions by constitutional courts are good, also, also international courts, uh, local courts, anything. We need to put pressure on the political elites, and this is, I repeat, in my opinion, 95% politics. We need to uh, put pressure on political elites, both by uh, activistic measures, by protesting, by uh, not complying to their insane and illogical measures, by lawsuits, on all levels, from international to local, and of course by uh, searching for solutions uh, everywhere we can find them. And now, when we have uh, finished this COVID, uh, this COVID topic, we should uh, go a step forward to the climate change. In European Parliament, uh, there are a lot of documents that are made, that are voted, that are debated, that are connected with climate change. So, I suppose many of you have heard of uh, European Green Deal. There is also a like, forest, forestry strategy and biodiversity strategy. There are many documents like that. And all of these documents, before going to the plenary session, where 704 members of European Parliament debate these proposals, they first go to any committee. Uh, they first go to our heads. And uh, most of these, most of these uh, documents are very similar to each other. They also 
what they do is they follow a political decision. I would also say that uh, there is a lot of politics in there and not as much science as it should be. Uh, because when, this all, when all of this climate change debate started, there were, there were two main schools of thought. One was, one was saying that uh, humanity is responsible for climate change, for uh, warming up of the planet and everything uh, that goes with it. And the other school of thought was claiming that this is all a natural process, that the Earth was uh, in its long history, had warmer periods, colder periods, and this, uh, what we are living today, is simply one new episode of such cyclic, uh, cyclic uh, turn of events. Uh, what I would like to see in the debate about climate change today is also what I would like to see in Corona discussion today. I want all of the uh, information to be taken into account. I want all of the scientists to be heard so that a uh, right decision can be made. Uh, much more space must be given to the scientists claiming that uh, the climate change is not human uh, response, that human civilization is not responsible for it or it is not responsible for it completely. And uh, when you read these documents that come to Parliament, that come to uh, our annual committee, what they are focused on is CO2, carbon uh, dioxide, and uh, they often speak of the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and that it was before industrial era this amount and now this amount. And they are mostly focused on this CO2 issue. But uh, rare, rarely you can find information or claims that like uh, methane is also uh, a gas that can uh, cause greenhouse effect. Also water vapor. Water vapor is by far uh, the, great, the, the gas that has uh, great impact, but uh, we just focused on this one, we are CO2, and uh, I think that uh, there is so much politics in this proposal, and we should also uh, give more space to science and to scientific debate, and what is the connection between these two topics? The connection is that uh, this official narrative of COVID comes from WHO and you have probably seen some prominent names, some billionaires discussing the crisis and when you see as well the other side, this uh, climate change side and who is uh, the main defender or the main promoter <laughs> of uh, this policy, you will see that often they are the same people and the, that these two narratives, the climate change narrative and the uh, corona narrative, are often coming from the same people, from the same institutions, uh, which have global impact. Of course there are climate change. Uh, I remember in the 90s when I was a child, there was a lot of, there was much more snow than you can see today. Uh, we can see extreme weather today, uh, where there was none before. But uh, climate is changing, it has been always changing, it will be always changing. But we need to know what are the uh, real causes of this. Is humanity responsible? If yes, how much? Is it 1%? Is it 50%? Are we 100% responsible for what is happening here? And uh, why, are just be, why are we just focusing on the climate? Why are we not discussing the microplastics pollution? You have oceans filled with garbage all around the world. There is so little debate about this. We are just focusing on this 
CO2 out of, so we are basically uh, environment committee and we are mostly focusing on the climate change. This, the climate change is the heart of our work and in this climate change the heart of this is the CO2. So basically we are looking things too narrow, we are looking things too much politically, not enough scientifically. And I think this uh, this should be changed, that we should uh, make a completely different approach on this. And for the end, as a conclusion, let me tell you a story to compare. Let's say that there will be an eclipse in one week. None of you knows that this eclipse will happen. So I come here as a prophet and I said, if you don't give me a million dollars, there will be an eclipse and you will all die. And uh, you don't trust me. And two or three days go by and you will start to see in the sky that something is going to happen. And uh, then I again ask you to give me money. And now some of you give me, some of you don't. And then three more days come by and everybody sees that there will be an eclipse and you see I was right and I'm a real prophet, not a fake prophet and you all gave me what I wanted so I used information we didn't have I also used knowledge of mathematics I could calculate that something is going to happen and you didn't know that and uh, so I brought fear here I exploited you, I robbed you, and I, in the end, was so smart, and I was uh, so powerful. But uh, if, I, if I was a good man, I could simply tell you why will there be an eclipse. It can be calculated mathematically, and I, then you would see it's a natural phenomenon. It's not my prophecy or my magical power that I created an eclipse. It is a natural thing that is happening. So, in this uh, story I use now, is it possible that somebody knows much more what is going to happen based on scientific data and that someone is using this knowledge to achieve certain political goals. I think this is possible. I'm not claiming that it is so, but I think it is possible and that we should consider it. Consider, discuss, compare arguments and not use censorship, not, uh, not uh, and we shouldn't use censorship or, or fear or uh, defamation or anything else. This is the connection between the corona crisis and the climate crisis and uh, I hope you will think about the story that I told you and I'm ready to accept whatever the truth is whatever the truth is and the point of science as I understand it I wanted to be a scientist as a young boy but then I, I'm basically an electrical engineer by profession but I wanted to be a scientist as a young boy, but soon I understood that there is very much politics and very much cheap politics and very much corruption in science. So I decided not to go that way. I wanted to improve the society first, to enlighten the society first as much as I could, and then perhaps to follow a scientific career. So the point of science, as I understand it, is that it can always change its mind at any time if there are sufficient arguments. First we have, we, we have uh, the evidence and then we make a conclusion. This is how science works. A dogma or a cult goes the vice versa. First we have a frame, we have a story and then we are looking which evidence can be fit in this frame. <laughs> and the one that don't fit, we just we just say they don't exist or that they don't have any value and the people who are bringing these arguments 
we want to get rid of them because they are undermining, they are destroying our official narrative. So, we need to have the argument so we can make a conclusion. This is the scientific way. And we have to abandon what the establishment is doing now. That they first have a story, they first have a theory or an approach, and then they either, uh, as I explained, eliminate all the information they, they, that don't fit in this story, or they either, or they invent some new evidence to back up their story. We told the media, uh, following this narrative, it's not that difficult. Thank you very much. This is the uh, this is the short version of my uh, present thoughts. It's in a nutshell. Thank you very much. <laughs>